Music is all I think about. From the moment I wake up in the morning to the moment I fall asleep at night. I was born to play. It's my reason for living. Your life is about to start. Microphone check. Much better. One, two. What is this? <laughs> Finish the line, Kemp. The five foot assassin, the roughneck business. There you go. <laughs> My name is Kemp Powers, and I am the co-director and the co-writer of Soul. My name is Paul Abadilla, and I'm the sets art director for Soul. Directing an animated feature is somewhat similar to directing a live action feature, only you don't have the live actors. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually kidding. It's actually nothing like directing a live action feature. One of the interesting things about animation is that um, it's an iterative process. If you watch a live action movie, you might look out for a mistake. You might look out for like a, an ill-placed coffee cup or, you know, an extra doing something in the background. Key thing to understand with animation is that there are no accidents. Every single thing that you see is there with intention. Every single blade of grass, there was an artist who put that blade of grass there. Every person moving, everything. And that's why animation takes so much longer than live action. Typically a Pixar movie takes between four and five years on average to, to make. Soul we made in four years, which was pretty much like a Pixar record in terms of speed. Yes! Woohoo! You know what that's gonna say, Joe Gardner? As a sets art director, part of my job is to carry out the visual language of the film set forth by the production designer. For me as an artist, I draw a lot. That's how I communicate. I communicate visually. So if I'm not working uh, traditionally on paper, I'm working um, digitally um, with my tablet and um, I use uh, software like Adobe Photoshop, which I use extensively throughout my workday. That helps me flesh out ideas from rough sketches all the way to refined paintings. Uh, to capture really the mood of whatever environment we're designing. When it comes to New York, we really rely heavily on Kemp's first-hand experience of having lived in New York, uh, especially Queens, because that's where Soul also takes place. New York City is basically almost like a character in the film of Soul, not just in the sets, but in, in the people. There's this like intangible flavor in the air um, that you that you find in New York. And I guess it's a combination of, what would you say, Paul? Like it's a combination of people, hip hop, trash, you know, <laughs> rodents. I don't know, it's just, it's a combination. Yes. It's, 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 it's something really hard to put your finger on, but but you know what it is when you see it. The the amount of care that went into it um, was, was super duper important to me because look, I, I got like an entire family who are gonna be scrutinizing this film. When Joe is in Queens, you should know it's Queens visually without saying anything before you see a single person in the street. And I mean, Paul was like really, really pivotal in that. I think it was great to have you on board to kind of back up some of my suggestions and vice versa when it came to a lot of the ideas that we threw at them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so we're trying to capture that into our set design uh, and how we dress the environment and how we see it. Uh, in the context of a, of a camera, how we light it. Um, so we really partner with Kemp and, and rely on his, on his knowledge uh, to make sure that whatever we're presenting on screen uh, feels authentic. Creating any of these movies, we ask everyone on the team from top to bottom to put their personal experiences into their work. We had uh, the, the collective contributions of over 300 people's personal experiences that really fleshed out this, this character, all the characters for that matter. And New York is one of the most diverse cities on the planet Earth. And while it is diverse and we wanted to reflect that diversity on screen, it was also really important that Joe pass through what I call authentic black spaces. Where whatever ethnicity you happen to be in New York City, there's a good chance that you spend a good amount of time in communities where it's just other people like you. For a black man, that might happen when you say, go get a haircut. I got the gig. I really need a haircut today, man. Can you it was so great when we started showing the film to particularly like famous black people of distinction, let's call them. 
and they pointed out like, oh, it's like I've been in that barbershop before. <laughs> like that felt like a real validation of the stuff that we were trying to do. Definitely. And when it comes to, you know, all the filmmakers for Seoul, you know, contributing their own life experiences and truths, I have to also just think about who I am as a person and my cultural identity. And when I think of my cultural identity, it's not just a singular thing. It's really a collective of all these other cultures that I, I identify with. That's something that Kemp and I share too. So uh, when it came to, you know, picking out details in say the, the barbershop or the graffiti, you know, textures around uh, the city, we, we shared that. And so that was uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed because I'm able to tap into my own life experiences and, um, you know, apply that into, into the final frame that, that we see in the film. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I really loved about working with Paul, like from the first day we met. I remember when Paul, he was responsible for doing some of the graffiti in the background of one of the shots. And, and I remember, Paul, you came and you showed me, you were like, oh, what do you think about me putting QGTM on, on the wall, which is a, an acronym, it means Queens gets the money. Queens get the money. And it's kind of like a slang that folks from Queens um, like to, to say a lot. And I was like, yes, we have to get that in there. Like all my cousins in Queens are gonna freak out when they see Queens get the money on the back wall. There's, there's something special about that. We can't take everybody into these locations firsthand. So it's because of these films, our, really our main goal is to capture that feeling, that truth of being there mm -hmm. and bringing that into, you know, into our storytelling, into, um, into our sets, our environments, our character design. That's, that's really our goal, to catch that emotional truth. Like speaking about sets in general, how does Soul compare to other Pixar films in terms of like the number and variety of sets? Is it, is it typical? Was it like less than usual? Was it more than usual? I mean, for me personally, I feel like we created at least three movies uh, within this one film <laughs> because we had like these distinct looks that had to be visually different from one, one another, but they needed to be cohesive as a whole. So that was the, the huge challenge too, being uh, somebody who who was involved in designing the, the sets the, um, in this film. Can you talk a little bit about how your cultural identity, how you identify culturally, how it's impacted your career, if at all? Yeah. So because of who I am and my cultural identity, um, I became involved in really helping shape the future generation of artists, not only um, in Pixar, but outside through talks, um, doing workshops, uh, mentorships. That um, experience really gave me an opportunity to develop um, some leadership uh, skills, which eventually led me to taking up some lead roles in the studio. Right, right. Yeah, you know, for me, this whole experience um, being in, in films period is like a second career, you know. I spent my first 17 years of my adult life as a, as a journalist. It wasn't uncommon at a lot of the news organizations that I worked at to be one of the only black faces in the newsroom, one of the only black faces in staff. And I think for a long time that felt like a bit of a burden to me, you know, this idea that like everything that I do um, isn't gonna just be judged as like, this is something that Kemp has succeeded or failed at. It would also potentially be judged as a shortcoming or an asset of, of black people in general. You know, it, it's an unfair burden to put on yourself, but it was something that was always kind of like in the forefront of my mind, particularly when I was younger. It's been really encouraging to me to see, particularly in recent years, lots of more, not just black, but all kinds of different diverse faces at the number of organizations that I've worked. I mean, we still got a long ways to go, but like even in the short period of time that I've been at Pixar, I've seen like a notable increase like across the board in, you know, animators, story artists, like people behind the scenes of, of color. I feel the same way um, because I'm very happy to, to see more diversity within the studio um, because I feel like the films that we're making, um, you know, should reflect um, the people that are making it. It was really important that we invited other partners to, to kind of like cover our blind spots and to make sure that we were being both culturally authentic um, and all, but also like sensitive to, to issues that different subsets of a group might have. So we formed not one, but two culture trusts. 
Um, one was actually an internal culture trust, and then we formed an external culture trust, which was everything from musicians to, to artists, to historians, to academics. And understand that both of these culture trust groups were not meant to simply rubber stamp the work that we were doing. Um, we involved them in every step of the way. As I'm sure Paul remembers, we would run everything by these groups. We'd run character designs, set designs, um, reels at various levels of development. And we had to redesign a lot of things based on the input of this culture trust. Do you remember that, Paul? Oh, definitely. I think just generally art is at its best when when the, the, the creators, you know, take the time to put themselves into the film. Yeah. And so these collaborators that, that we met with, they're, um, they're just as much as uh, a part of this film as we are, um, as people right. who are working at Pixar, because it's really their truth that we are trying to convey um, into this film, into the story. Let's leave New York City for a second and talk a little bit about the zone. Um, I gotta say, like the the concept of the zone is probably one of my um, favorite parts of of Soul, um, and it's basically this idea that you know, as a musician, as an artist, um, sometimes when you're doing something you love, it becomes almost like transcend transcendent. You know, like you go into a flow state, and it's like you're not even there anymore. It's like your your hands, your body is kind of moving on its own and, and, and doing its own thing. And we wanted to like visually represent that in the film. And so, you know, but we also thought about this idea of what if people really did go someplace else? What if the zone was actually a physical place where every single thing that is happening on Earth among living beings is basically represented psychically in the zone? It allowed us to kind of visualize music in, in a new, in a very, very cool way. And it also allowed us to create, um, unfortunately for you guys, yet another <laughs> world with a whole new new series of sets. <laughs> Fun times. I mean, yeah, it was, uh, it was it was really a treat to be able to see like a visual representation of what it means to be in the zone. It was really, really exciting uh, and rewarding to, to see it manifested um, into, uh, you know, drawings, into, uh, you know, renderings of what this could possibly be. Right. Hey, have you ever managed to get into that flow state um, yeah. in your workspace? Like, what, what do you do to get into the zone? I don't mean to sound existential, but maybe we should because, you know, this is, this is the film that we're creating. Um, exactly, for, we created an existential film. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and so for me, the zone is really, um, just things start to just stop in time and uh, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it automatically because I already know how to complete the task. It's really just a vehicle to take me to that endpoint to manifest that visualization, that future that I've initially um, um, imagined. So the zone for me is that process from getting from point A to point B. Oddly enough, I don't think I go into the zone until the finished work is presented. By the time we finished and I actually saw it up on the screen, I wasn't even watching it anymore. It's like that's when I finally was able to go to another place. And it was with other people hearing their reactions to, to the work that we've done over all these years. I think that's when I'm finally able to, to go into my personal zone. I really, really can't wait to share the story that we're trying to tell. Yeah, me too, man, me too. <laughs>